Neil, thank you very much for joining me today. Excited to be here, Chris. So I'm looking forward to this conversation, Neil, because we are going to be talking about quite a few different things, but mostly digital marketing for local businesses. But before we get into all of that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, about Made This, and about your journey to getting to you, well, getting you all the way here to the All About Digital Marketing podcast? Yeah, sure. So, uh, Chris, I, well, Chris and everyone, my name is Neil. I live in Los Angeles, and Chris, we're joking about that because apparently that's your favorite place in the world, and and it is a little better weather here than where you are right now. But you know, I won't rub it in too much. Have to rub it in, Neil. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I mean, from Los Angeles, I um, born and raised around Southern California, and um, my first start in my career was in venture capital. Did that for a few years uh, and decided, hey, why not start a cleaning company, right? Because that's the normal transition from venture capital, of course. So I started a uh, cleaning company focused on vacation rentals, like Airbnbs and turnovers, uh, mainly because you know I wanted to travel and a couple other reasons. So uh, started launch, made this, and... Um, Made this focuses mostly on LA area as well as San Francisco. And we recently started franchising with Made This Franchise. So just expanding the model, but it is a remote business model which focuses on vacation rental cleanings. So I've been doing that for a few years and heavy, heavy focus on local marketing, which is how we're able to grow. So this is like a paradox for most people listening. And even to me, when I received the email to, to, get, to get you onto mm-hmm. the show, you run remotely a local business. Yep, exactly, exactly. It's it's almost like a full circle, right? Like this is not what you do. You have a local business to be local, uh, but I have a local business to be remote. And it's funny, Chris. It's it's uh, I did it out of necessity uh, because I wanted to mainly travel. Right? I wanted to quit and say, "Hey, I'm going to go backpacking for a year, but I want something to do." And I was like, "Wait, I have this local business. Uh, it's going well, way better than anything else I'm trying to do remotely." Because, uh, of course, your first thing when you want to quit and travel is I got to go be a digital nomad. I got to go make it like an e-commerce company or like do a digital marketing agency or like, you know, something where like the, the playbook online, which they sell you says these five steps and you will be a digital nomad. So anyways, I was trying all of that kind of stuff. But the only thing which was working was my local company. Um, so I just decided I went on a quest to say, how do I make this remote and kind of figured it out. And then I figured out a ton of great uh, benefits of having a local company, uh, which completely outshined a lot of the other things I was doing. So we're going to focus mainly on the marketing aspects for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Clue is in the title, Chris. Yeah. I've got to remember this <laughs> rather than me just like digging into the business. But before we jump into that, for me, and I think for most people, when we think local business, we do think, you know, retail location, for example, or somewhere where people can come in and out of. And also mm. I think, you know, staff, people, team you know how are you doing all of this so just before we jump into the actual marketing elements of it how does that actually work how have you managed to set this up so that you could be traveling and everything is still happening on a local scale sure so the key is that the the staff go from their homes to the job site Um, so i think the key for any what i call a remote local business is having that ability of the jobs are not done in your physical storefront location. It's mostly a service-based business. So this is a, a cleaner focused business service-based. You could have painting, you could have landscaping, you could have moving, but all of this is not done at your offices. So that's the number one key of having, the first step of having a remote local business model is making sure the job can be done elsewhere and you don't need somewhere to report to. If that's the case, then you could start plugging in the gaps with other aspects. Like, for example, the only time we need someone with boots on the ground is when we were doing in-person interviews. Now, post-COVID, cleaner population is completely fine doing Zoom interviews now, right? That was never the case before. Uh, so now it's like we truly don't need someone local. Um, but before that was just the only time we needed someone local was for um, group interviews. But besides that, everyone just goes straight to the job site. So you don't really need an office front. I, like I'm really excited about this because I'm now just <laughs> learning more than anything else. So apologies for anyone who's listening and we will get to the digital marketing section in a second. Um, are these, <laughs> the last are minute these, like, of the show, Chris. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. But it's fine. We'll get to that. Um, yeah. it, it's the interesting parts because this is where I think a lot of people fall down with a lot of ideas or mm-hmm. they get stuck in their own way of thinking. You clearly have taken this to, to the nth degree in the sense of like, bang, there you go, local business that doesn't require someone to be sat somewhere or an office like that. But I was going to ask, have you created, oh, sorry, are you employing all of the cleaners directly for your organization? Or have you almost created like the Uber of 
cleaning holiday lets or Airbnbs and stuff where people can log in and out and do this? Yeah, so it's somewhere in the middle, we definitely are not the Uber, nor do we want to be, because especially with vacation rentals, the focus is on quality so much. You have to get good reviews. You can't just send anyone to do a cleaning. A lot of companies have tried that. A lot of companies have failed at that. Um, nor are we saying, hey, we're taking complete ownership over the, the cleaners. That is a model which what does work. But for what we're doing in California, we do use independent contractors. Uh, but there's a heavy, heavy vetting process. 2% of them make it through our application process. Uh, we do, you know, a five-step interview process. We help them get onboarded. We make sure the customers uh, understands everything going on. So I guess you could consider us kind of like a middleman in between, but like a highly curated middleman is how I describe it, where, hey, we've met these people in person. We, we know about them. We've done background checks. Like everything much more systemized and much more localized, uh, which is really needed when it comes to uh, cleaning, right? I, I don't think cleaning is something that can be Uberized because, you know, if you drive from one place to another, that's it. It's a drive. But cleaning, it really just depends on the quality of the person. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, cool. Now we can get to the good part. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you've done this and you're, <clears throat> and especially if you're using sort of independent contractors or, or other firms and everything else, you've done this by capturing the localized market in your area around LA where there's mm. a lot of Airbnbs and there's a lot of holiday rentals for obvious reasons. Um how have you managed to start doing that? How how did this start and how did it grow in terms of the digital aspects? Yeah, I mean, first we – the first thing was making a website, right? I didn't, I didn't even know how to make a website. I wasn't working on finance and spreadsheets. But I figured out how to make a crappy version one of a website, threw it up. And at this time, this was my side hustle. So I had to figure out how to do everything virtually because I, I couldn't be there to pick up the phones all the time. So I thought, okay, I'm only going to focus on digital marketing because I can't do flyering or you know anything like that. So my first uh, job came from Google AdWords. I didn't know what I was doing. I threw up an ad. I probably paid way too much for the cost per click, but hey, it worked, right? So uh, the, the secret of this business and what I love about the cleaning business is that it is highly recurring, meaning it is, you know, if you get a customer, you keep the customer there. They need a cleaning every two weeks, every month, at least. If it's vacation rentals, even more. Therefore, your cost per acquisition um, it can't be a lot higher because this is a recurring sale. So even though you spend 50 bucks, 100 bucks on a Google um, AdWords lead and they convert, it's okay. Uh, but I first started just with Google AdWords, expanded from there to say, you know, review sites are big in the, in the US. Yelp is very big, especially in LA. So started to get on that and do paid ads for there and, you know, SEO and kind of just kept expanding from there. But all purely in the digital realm is what we were doing just because I couldn't do anything physical because of my limitations with my business. It's really interesting because we talk about this on the show a lot, which is understanding the lifetime value of a customer mm. and actually <clears throat> repeat business. You know, it costs, I think it's 20% um, of the cost of acquiring a new customer to basically re-engage with an existing customer. And mm. something like you've just mentioned there, understanding, you know, that it is a repeat business thing. If it's good when you mm. do a good service and you don't take the mick in terms of price or anything else, you're creating something that really actually works for the client. And once they've got that person, a bit like having a good mechanic or a good builder or a good anything, you're mm -hmm. not going to change. Like <clears throat> you keep using the same person again and again. So the lifetime value after the acquisition is enormous in comparison to that one first time clean. Absolutely. Absolutely. And here, here is kind of the, the hidden gem of the local business, which I, it's why I like it more than more than anything else, is that your competition doesn't really know what they're doing. Of course, there's going to be players who compete with you all the time, especially depending on your city. For the big city like New York, a lot of big players in the cleaning market. But in general, this industry is probably two years behind the time in terms of digital marketing. Now, what does that mean? That means if you do basic stuff, SEO, email marketing, uh, email funnel. Uh, basic Google AdWords with landing pages. Like you're already way ahead of the competition just by doing stuff which has existed for a long time, but you're doing it uh, because the competition doesn't exactly know what they're doing. Uh, and the reality is with this business model, like we talked about, Chris, highly, highly recurring. So if you really know your numbers cold with acquiring a customer, you could scale pretty rapidly, make a pretty large business in a very small territory size, meaning you don't need a business which caters to the whole world and compete against the whole world. Just compete against your local market they don't know what they're doing, and you could have a business model which is highly recurring in that market. It's almost like a natural geographic barrier to entry, but using global marketing tactics to do it. So I, I think it's just an unfair competitive advantage if you know digital marketing and know your numbers. It's interesting because you mentioned obviously starting off and you're learning all of this 
for the first time. And mm-hmm. obviously this was back in, you mentioned 2013, I think. When I first, when started, first started, yeah. Yeah. So 2013, which now feels <clears throat> like a lifetime ago, let's be honest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that, that might just be the last 12 months yeah. that have happened on 10 <laughs> years. Um, but obviously starting back then and not knowing what to do and, and trying all these things, how many things did you try? Did you literally only try Google AdWords at the very beginning or did you try several things, but Google AdWords was the one that kind of got you that first customer? Yeah, at the, at the beginning, because I knew nothing about digital marketing. And I guarantee you everyone who's listening to this show, just by virtue of listening to this show, knows more about marketing than I did at that time. So that was like the first thing where I, like, I heard of AdWords. I'll give this a shot and let, let's see what happens. So we tried it and it, it kind of worked. Um, of course, in hindsight, if I look back at it, I'm like, I probably paid fifty dollars for that, and you know, it, it didn't make any sense. It was a one-time sale or something like that. But anyways, it got me going. So I started there. Then you you peruse forums. You're like, okay, where else? You know, okay, but Yelp's. Let's try Yelp SEO. You know, then you work with some sketchy sketchy SEO vendors and you get the switch, and you kind of learn that whole process. So it definitely was a trial and error. And I wish I kind of moved faster. To be honest, I wish I knew to test multiple things at once. I didn't. Um, so I said, I'm going to devote money to AdWords and figure out what customer acquisition cost is. I don't even know what this is. Um, and then go to the next one and ask people and say, oh, okay, you're doing Yelp. You're doing Craigslist. Let's let's try this out too. Um, in hindsight, I would have done multiple things at once, devoted a specific budget to it, monitored the return, and then go, and went from there. That's how I would have done it. Out of interest, do you still have the copy of that first ever ad in your AdWords account? I probably do. I'll dig it up. It's, it looks something like, want a cleaning? First time. <laughs> We're super cheap just because we want customers. <laughs> it's it's always one of my favorite things to yeah. go back on. When you look at like the original ever podcast episodes, the original ever YouTube videos for people that have done well at these things. And when you look at the first one, you always kind of had that little moment of, oh, do you remember this? Uh, <laughs> this works, but my good God, I wouldn't write yeah. it like that anymore. I know. There's a um, a website where you could find, I forget what it's called, like Time Caps or something. You could find your website, how it looked originally. So I recently looked up my website from 2013. And oh my God, I, I made the logo on Microsoft Word um, and everything just looks terrible. Like, I can't believe someone booked with us with a website that looks like this, but it works, I guess, I guess back in 2013. Uh, but it is cheap funny cleaning. And cheap cleaning. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> okay, yeah. so we talked a little bit. <laughs> I look forward to seeing it. If you do manage to find <laughs> that original copy, please send it through. I'll um, send it for sure. So obviously, as this kind of starts to evolve and as things start to do better, I'm guessing the business starts building up some traction and stuff. At this point, you're building a team are you outsourcing more parts of the work what what have you done to to kind of grow that and to scale it from those initial steps those initial wins to to getting that uh to getting to that next stage yeah so i mean the first step i think with any entrepreneur is outsource the part you don't like to do or can't do so because of the limitations of this was my side hustle for a long time i had to initially outsource uh picking up the calls and taking messages Next, there was too many cleaners contacting me directly for issues, so I had to then find someone else to handle the cleaner calls. So the two pieces would be operations, which is cleaner-focused, or sales, which is customer-focused. Those would be the two first pieces I had to outsource from there. Uh, To be honest with the marketing, in general, I do like digital marketing, so I held on to that mostly myself. And the reality is, uh, like I said, you, you just need to do a lot of the base stuff in local marketing, and you're already beating the competition. So I haven't really had to, like... Um, find an internal person to manage that until only recently. Um, but mostly it's just through vendors. I've been using vendors for everything with digital marketing. Um, you know, SEO vendors, Yelp's super easy to set up yourself. You know, then you do just quoting engines like Thumbtack or Angie's List, things like that. If you want to try AdWords, you know, give that a shot. Google Local is fantastic right now. So that one, you don't need someone to set it up. Um, so yeah, I started to build the team more internally for sales and operations, marketing, didn't really need that just because just local businesses you know if you know if you know a little bit you know more than most people so this brings us on to nicely the google local or google my business and this Mm -hmm. is something that a lot of people overlook Uh, and in fact one of the recent episodes that we did was with uh, diana richardson from semrush uh, Mm -hmm. and she's in charge of their their social stuff and we were talking about exactly this the amount of ways that small local businesses Mm -hmm. can actually appear on page one 
without yep. having to rank page one for a, a particular term. So yep. how important has Google My Business been for you or what were the those kind of initial stages that that looked like for Google Local from your point of view? Yeah, I mean, Google My Business is like, I think our number one driver, right? So there's certain things which I think are fundamental stuff that uh, every local business needs to do. And for our franchisees now, we just do that because I know how important it is, right? We th You talk about SEO, you talk about email marketing, you talk about online reviews. Like those three, absolutely, without a doubt, you need to do all those three. So we just take that on for our franchisees and say, we're going to do this for you because it's so critical. So Google My Business uh, and at least ranking on the map pack, that's where we get most of our leads. Now, the way Google is structured now, you look at the top uh, for local businesses. If you type in like cleaners near me, you're going to see Google local ads first. You're going to see AdWords next. You're going to see the map pack. And then you're going to see organic all the way at the bottom. So the value of organic, I think, in local markets has gone down drastically because it's fourth on the tier, right? They're, you're hitting so many different areas before they even see you on Google. So the map pack, which is Google My Business, best place to rank like for free, quote unquote, without having to pay for ads. So we focus a lot on that. And um, you know that's a lot of just keeping your Google My Business profile updated, making sure it looks good, constantly posting. Reviews are key. Um, here's the secret for that though, as well, uh, Google local, which is the paid service. The Google local is different from AdWords. Um, I'll, I'll quickly explain what that is, Chris. Google local is, um, local service providers. You click the ad on the top of Google and, uh, it'll display and you you call them through Google and they will pay. Usually you will pay like between 30 or $45 per call. So not cheap, uh, but the conversion rate's a lot higher because it's phone calls mostly. Um, and it's great conversion rate. If someone leaves someone finds you through Google, they book a service and then they leave a review. That review is reflected uh, much more powerfully on your Google My Business page because Google knows it's it's from a real person. So the combination of Google Local as well as Google My Business, um, if you work those in tandem with each other, it is truly powerful for that. And we actually don't do many do much AdWords, pure AdWords anymore, uh, just because if you have those two engines running pretty well, uh, you're in good shape. I know that the, uh, the the review side of things is a big piece for, for many, many companies, I think, whether it's yeah. local services, local businesses, <clears throat> or, or anybody else as well. Um, what? How have you used different ways of, you know, proof of or social proof uh, and those kind of reviews to really mm. help bolster your marketing other than what we just talked about in terms of Google Local? But are you using those reviews in other ways as well? Mostly on our website, right? So you think about, um, they you know, the customer experience. They'll find you like they say through Google. They start typing cleaners near me. They go to my Google my business page, say, Oh, these guys have good reviews. They'll click it, go to the website. Now they're on the website. Now it's going to the ballpark of how do I convert this person to either call us or book online? So we have um social proof everywhere. Meaning uh they're gonna we have some video testimonies from customers which we immediately display to them. There's a scrolling bar of the Google reviews on the booking page, especially on like where they enter their credit card information, just to show that you know, that there's social proof and other people have booked this too. So uh, there's drivers of social proof everywhere on the website just to make sure we can convert them. But number one, we're defining us probably Google or probably Yelp, right? So you just got to make sure reviews on those platforms are pristine and it makes it a lot easier once they actually hit your web page. Do you think that because of the length of time that you've been sort of playing with all these parts from the very beginning in 2013 and then obviously devising better and better strategies. Do you think that helps with your the overall uh, Google results that you're getting today? Yeah, undoubtedly, right? Because if there's a new player, uh, and if anyone here says, hey, I'm going to go start a local business, that's great, but it's still going to take time to build those reviews, right? You can't go from like zero to 300 in one month, or Google is going to flag you and take down your Google My Business profile anyways. So it does take time. You know, I think we have over 300 reviews on our, our single Google My Business page, more on the other ones. Um, so that takes time, right? It, it, it's hard to do that. So we have the most Google reviews for cleaning companies in LA. Uh, you're not going to get that at the first year. It's just not possible, but you could have a great, uh, tactic for getting reviews and get there quickly. Uh, for example, we do, uh, we have like a text message based review platform. Cleaning is done automatically. The customer is going to get a text. They can leave a review on Google, Facebook, Yelp, and they just click a button with it and they're able to do it. I wish I did at the beginning because I feel like we'd have over 500 reviews right now if I did, but we didn't, right? So I think if you at least know what you're doing, uh, and look, this is what we're advising franchisees now of saying, hey, just don't do all the mistakes I did because you're going to have this terrible Google AdWords copy. It's going to say, please, we're the cheapest cleaning service. 
Uh, so now I just do all this stuff for them. Like, look, send these text messages, uh, aim for two Google reviews per week, if you can, depending on your customer volume. And look, within a year, you already have 100, right? Within two years, you have 200. Most That's already going to be more than 95% of companies out there. Um, so there's ways to speed things up if you know what you're doing with getting reviews. I wish I did, man. Uh, we would have double or triple the reviews of everyone else. But, hey, at least we're doing it right now. We've got reviews a little bit spread out over all sorts of different various platforms over the years. So whether it was some people that left nice reviews for us on Facebook <clears> and then now we've had some more on Google and then now you've got and you're like that. Oh, for God's sakes, I got bits <laughs> and pieces everywhere. <laughs> uh, so, so we stick to the testimonials and, uh, and we record customers actually on video chatting to say, yeah, we had a good experience. Although my favorite review video we have, one of our clients, we said, so what do you think of Social Link? And he went, hmm and just sort of sat there for a while and didn't say anything. We were like, that, yeah. Jesus, this makes for great content. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, we're going to edit this out, okay? Is that okay yeah. with you? We, we didn't. We kept it in because eventually he was like that. The thing is, you guys bring so much to the table afterwards. I was like that, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure where that review was going to go. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do yeah. think it's something that a lot of people are hesitant or even scared about. Um, and I was wondering from your point of view, you know, good reviews obviously are great. But mm. you don't always get a good review. And mm. for us, we work a lot in social media. Obviously, as an agency, it's our core practice. But one of the biggest things that we say is that anyone that argues, that says that you're rubbish, that says that they had a bad experience or anything else, for me, is a learning opportunity. And the mm. way you interact with that person online and in public can mean a lot to the next person that comes along. There was a problem. Oh, it was resolved. Oh, actually, look, they responded really quickly, one thing or another. But what would you say to people that are a little bit worried or did you have, ever have any kind of worries about the reviews and getting those kind of negative inputs coming through every now and again? It's absolutely. All the time. Even like literally yesterday, I think we got a two-star review on Google, which is, you know, it, it's, it hurts when that happens. Even now, eight years after doing business, every time I see that, I'm like, oh, my God, like what happened over here? Like how did this, this possibly happen? Um, I would say it's probably different, Chris, from where you are because, you know, American customer service. Customers always write to – the nth degree where the customer says, well, I want a refund. And you're like, well, like, you know, er everything was done according to what you ordered. Like, no, I, st I still want a refund. Like, this doesn't make any sense, but this is American customer service, unfortunately. Uh, so I'd say it's a little bit on steroids over here. Um, however, responding to reviews and handling reviews well, I agree. It's almost like the first bad review you get is going to hurt, and everyone after that becomes a little bit more bearable, especially when you have – a large volume of reviews to drown out the bad reviews, to be honest. that That's make sure every other customer is hugely happy and it's okay because, you know, there's got to be one, one bad review here and there. And I read a study recently, which said, um, at least on Google, my business customers don't trust five star companies. They don't. The, the, the most trusted factors around like a 4.6 or so is kind of where they look 4.6, 4.7, but if five star, not good. 4.9, not good. They're just not going to trust it. Um, so just know that, hey, having some bad reviews sprinkled in here just makes you real, makes you like a normal company, nothing sketch. Um, so customers actually might like to see that. And Chris, uh, kind of what you said, I think it's very wise, which is respond to every customer. Try to handle it. Try to get the customer to take down the review if they have a good experience. But if, if not, at least respond to it publicly in a very nice way and just move on. Chris, what have you seen or what do you recommend usually? Well, to be fair, it's interesting because it's one of those things where, and again, we, it's not necessarily just with reviews. We work with a lot of companies where they might not have a review-based system or they're more in service-based or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we've always realized that when you do have a negative comment, ignoring it is probably the worst thing you can do. Um, and because like you mentioned, right, anyone who sees that there's real human beings behind it, i.e. you're not seeing the, oh, look, they've got 400 reviews and it's all five stars and they got all the reviews in six months and you think, hang on a second, this doesn't really make sense or it doesn't look very good. The reality is it's the same with your social media. If you just ignore everybody who ever writes something like, oh, is this a sort, this isn't the sort of service that I would expect or anything else, you've got to respond. And that shows the human element, which I think is one of the most important parts in social media. It's been forgotten. We, you know, social media used to be called social networks. They were mm. networks. They were all about people interacting. And then we somehow lost that and we just drone look through footage as if we're, uh, we're animals or robots or something. I don't know. But the reality is that engagement with people, whether it's good or bad, being open, being honest, being transparent, having that conversation online for me 
is a powerhouse when it comes to looking through companies afterwards. And you can tell the ones that are good at it, right? You can see the ones that take the time to respond to every single comment and engagement <clears throat> that ask people for their feedback and that actually mm -hmm. respond well to it as well. Because I think all, all of those negative comments are also a really good eye opener. When we're in our business, you know, there's a lot of things you, you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes all it takes is actually somebody saying something along the lines of, you know, oh, this was terrible and I never got my invoice. And you go, hang on a second, why did that happen? And before you realize it, you realize there's a broken link in your system and you go, oh, crap, right, that's what I need to fix. So I think all of these things yep. are opportunities more than anything else to respond and actually get better. Like, you know, we can all do better. Let's be honest. I'd love to sit here and say I'm amazing. I'm not. If somebody wants to send in and ask me why I spent so long messaging or talking, sorry, to you about your business rather than the digital marketing aspect, I'm happy to take that kind of feedback on board <laughs> and admit you're yeah. right. I did. But that's part and parcel of this beautiful world that we live in where Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, they can be lovely places. They can be horrible places. You have to find that in between and be solid enough to be able to respond in public. Uh, absolutely. And it, it is tough because like, even with this two-star review, which came in yesterday, I'm dreading because this is not a fun thing to do. It'd be great to deal with happy customers all the time, but I'm like, great. I, how do we deal with this? I have to get someone on the team to make sure to call her, see if she's happy, kind of coordinate things. It's a pain in the butt and it takes time. Um, but Chris, you threw out some stats earlier, which I think was very interesting, which is um, how much it costs less to take care of existing customers as opposed to go hunting for new customers. Right? And I'm sure you have even better stats about this for your audience, but this, even from a numbers perspective, makes so much sense if Look, if you just take care of existing customers, even though you have to maybe give back money or something like that, it might be easier just to retain that customer instead of hunting for somebody new, even though it is painful in the short term. So from a pure tactical standpoint, if you have no intention of getting better through this feedback for whatever reason, uh, at least it just it's still logically, or not logically, business-wise makes sense for you to uh, respond to this customer and take care of them because it's going to be cheaper for you in the long run. There's another thing as well, and we talk to a lot of customers about this or clients about this, because there's also this perceived value aspect. And I, I talk about this in the sense of if somebody says, look, I'm not happy, give me my money back, for example, mm -hmm. you also have the ability to go back and say, well, look, you know, terms and conditions say we don't give refunds, for example, which is fine. But you also have the ability to say, look, we want to make this right. So the next one is on me. Next month is on me. We're going to make sure that we do this right. Tell me exactly what were the things where we feel like you, you feel like I let you down and you can actually bring extra value. And again, what you're doing is potentially giving away a certain amount, maybe the same amount that you might lose, but that's still tiny in comparison to your lifetime value of your customer. <clears throat> and this is where I think a lot of people get stuck in like, well, here's your money back, go away and delete them and block them off Twitter or Facebook or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that that's always the right choice. Don't get me wrong. There are some people that deserve to be blocked and just mm -hmm. ignored because some people you'll never be able to have a real conversation with. Um, and you will get some, I can't think of a polite way of saying, you get some <laughs> people that are really crappy um, yeah. and that will literally just write that it was crap because they want to try and get the refund or they want to try and get their money back, not because it was a particularly bad service or anything else. But I think for the vast majority, human beings want to have that interaction. They want to feel validated. They want you to understand what their concerns are. And if you can do that properly, you'd be amazed how many people will carry on with you the following <clears> month afterwards and just be like that. That was epic. They might even become your best customer. They might become your most raving fan because you cared about them, which is a lot more than lots of other companies are doing. Yeah. Absolutely. Chris, this is something where I think um, maybe a lot of people who do digital marketing don't get to is pick up the phone and calling the customer, right? The customer who's mad. And I think that's something we at our, our, at our um, California office do very well. So we have, a, in my opinion, a great customer service team. Right. Maybe maybe uh, we're going to be disorganized sometime and not get back to them quickly, but then we'll call them and apologize for it. We'll text them. We'll say, hey, are, when are you free to hop on a call and actually solve this, um, which is almost understated. I don't know how many more bad reviews we would have had if we didn't get on the phone and call them and say, hey, I'm actually a real person. I'm trying to talk to you. Uh, and the secret, honestly, <laughs> Chris, is we have um, – uh, our customer service team is based, based in South Africa, meaning they have a pretty cool accent. It kind of sounds a British. And as you know, Americans love British accents. So they hear the phone and they're like, hey, that's a that's a cool accent. And it just diffuses the situation. And then after that, we could kind of get to the core of what's actually wrong. Uh, but that's something I think is is kind of undervalued nowadays is 
forget email interaction, just like literally pick up the phone. And once you're they're talking to a real person, it is very hard for someone to stay mad at you if you're just talking with them, apologizing. It's like how can you continue to kick someone when they're down? Uh, and it really diffuses a lot, a lot of things. So that's something I think people should do more of in those world. I couldn't agree more. And also, don't ignore the problem. Like that's the key thing. So you know, all of our when we're working with clients, everyone's on Slack. They've all got their own individual Slack channels where they can interact with all of our team. Mm. Any third parties that are involved in their processes as well are all included. And if we get a message that says I'm not happy about X, jump on that straight away. Don't bury your head in the sand don't do anything like that and also be honest with people this is another thing that i'm we've we've had a couple of clients over the last year that we've fired not in a nasty way but we've been like that look this isn't going to work this isn't the sort of relationship that we want and we're not going to be able to help serve you the best way but at the same time we'll also have conversations with clients and say is this the right service for you because what you're asking isn't what you signed up for there seems to be some, you know, miscoordination somewhere. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily do. When you're looking for the cash and you're just trying to grab some money, you might say yes, yes, yes. And then actually invariably you end up causing the two star review. And I think that's something for people to really be open and honest with. There's nothing wrong with saying to a customer, look, actually, that's not really something we do. This is actually what our business does. Um, and making sure that's clear and communicated well, I think can be mm -hmm. really, really powerful. Chris, uh, I'm curious, complete tangent. You said something earlier. All of your clients have their own Slack channel, which you connect to. So are you literally like clicking into each Slack channel as a question pops up? Or how do you actually manage that with that many clients? Well, to be fair, we've got a really good team. And basically, we look after people. Usually, we have a couple of slightly more demanding clients. Sorry, mm -hmm. guys, if you're listening. I'm sure you know who you are. Um, but for the vast majority of what we do, we work on a principle of two weeks ahead for social media. So we never are in a position where, oh my God, quick, this has to be done right now or anything like that. So we mm. have a really good flow. We've got great systems in place. We use systems like Planable where the clients can literally go in, see all of their content. So we'll give them updates. We do recording sessions once or twice a month, depending on the package that clients are on. Um, so all of this is done massively prepped in advance, ready to go. And basically it's smooth sailing for 95 i'm going to be really careful because as i say this out loud it's going to pop up on my slack and everything's going to light up <laughs> it's smooth they're sailing for about 95 percent of our clients but mm -hmm. what we found was is before we did this it's emails and a barrage of emails coming in all day every day is awful because you've got to get around to reading them you kind of sift through them <clears throat> people waffle in emails they don't waffle so much on slack so having that really short ability to go, hey, guys, just wanted to check in about X question mark. Great. We can then give an update really quickly and, and really easily. When we used to get it on emails, people would send us emails going, hey, guys, just quickly, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, X, mm. Y, Z, and start bullet pointing all these ideas because they had nothing better to do than write that email. So we found that it turned everything. Actually, it turns it around quicker. It's faster. Clients understand if we don't respond within 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, it's because we're busy or we're on calls or whatever else. But it's a really nice environment mm. where everyone can be open enough to be able to say like, hey, John, what happened to this? Or, hey, Chris, why isn't that happening? And you're like, that that is happening. We just haven't sent it through yet. Give me two minutes, blah, 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 whatever it'll be. So it's a nice environment we find. It, it is interesting. With, I mean, we use Slack, like a hard, hardcore Slack users in terms of our internal operations. And I was just thinking yesterday, like I, I, I still use email, but I'm trying to think about when I use email. It's only if there's someone external, not inter internally with the team, and we need to copy people on it. That's like pretty much the only time we would use email now. And I kept thinking like it, it's so funny how it's almost outdated, but Slack, in my opinion, uh, you can sometimes lose chains because it's just like a boom, like a barrage of, of messages come in. So it really is like an ebb and flow, but it, it just kind of blew my mind literally just yesterday i was like wow i really don't use email unless i'm communicating with someone ex externally i can't imagine sending my team members something over email they'd be like why are you why are you is this, this, this is so formal what are you doing am i in trouble but, but that's the thing it's become like formal that's the so yeah actually, if you absolutely do need to send something that's like super important or you know you need to look at this then it goes on email but everything else we don't really use yeah. it anymore um but yeah, that's a, again, that's just a, probably a preference thing. Uh, right. Before we wrap up, what's the number one tip, tool, hint, trick, whatever for local businesses that are listening right now 
to get them on the right track <clears throat> to getting more success, more sales, more leads, whatever it is that they're trying to do? What's your number one tip? Uh, you know, I, I've already alluded to what the number one thing I would recommend to in terms of local marketing is. I'm going to say it again. Uh, for our franchisees, there are things we do which I think are just the core, like the, the foundations of what local services are. And that's three things is SEO, email marketing, uh, and what as well as reviews. So if you make sure those funnels are working great, uh, that is huge right there because that's already going to fix 80% of it. And after that, you just find whatever platforms are great for you. If Yelp's great for you, great, dive into that. But if you're doing those three things, and like pay pay the money for it. Like if you don't want to do email marketing yourself, find someone else to do it. I, for a long time, I just cheaped out and said, you know what? I'll do it when I have a chance to. I'm an okay writer. I got a B plus in my class in high school. Like I could, I could, I could do this. Uh, but the reality is you just want to spend time. You're actually not going to do it. It has such a huge ROI, kind of like Chris and I were talking about, which is this is going to mostly existing customers, people who already know your brand. Huge, huge ROI from email marketing, which maybe you don't think about. So my tip for everyone is uh, if you have a local business or think about starting a local business, those three things I think universally are going to be uh, the best for your business. I couldn't agree more. Um, and especially on the bit of if you're not going to do it yourself, just pay somebody else to do it. That's uh, yep. that's a really key thing. And I'm not saying that because we do it like in any way, shape or form. Yeah. But I'm saying it in the basis of because otherwise it, it doesn't get done. It's yep. as simple as that. Right. And it just kind of gets put off and put off and put off. Um, Neil, where can people find you online? Where can people find out more about Made This and more importantly, Made This franchise as well? Sure. So <clears throat> you just go to madethisfranchise.com, M-A-I-D-T-H-I-S franchise.com. You could uh, message me over there. Also, my personal website, uh, neilparek.co. Uh, you could head over there as well and message me, and I will see all the messages personally. I love it. Neil, thank you so much. That was fun, Chris. Thanks for having me. <laughs>